Hi, everyone, and welcome again to another Gaudium at Spiz 22.com podcast and uh, YouTube video. Uh, for those who watch these things, you know, wow, uh, I'm on a roll with a lot of podcasts lately. Uh, I had two or three this past week. Another one today with my good friend, returning guest, longtime podcasting partner, Kale Zeldin. Next week, I'm interviewing various other people, including George Weigel. And then nice. I'm off to, and then I'm off to Rome uh, for the entire month of October to cover the Senate on synodality. And that's what I wanted to have. Uh, well, actually it was Kale's idea. He, yes. he texted me on, on, fault, X, my yeah, my on X and he said, we need to do a show before you go to Rome. So anyway, before we get into all that, welcome back Kale Zeldin. Larry, it's great to be here. Um, really it's great to be, you've been lining up some, some great conversations on, on your, on your channel. So it's been really cool uh, to see that. I know you did one earlier today that I'm looking forward to hearing just uh, having you talk about it, but um, yeah, no, doing well. School year started, and um, you know, I, you know, I get the itch right to have the conversation with Larry after a, a, an amount of time uh, transpires, and you know, a lot on the brain. But I remember you saying we, I believe, did a show in the aftermath of the first session of the Synod on Synodality, which I guess would have been in October of twenty three. And I know, you know, that this is coming up. I, you know, I know a lot of people in the United States are um, watching uh, with eager dread and anticipation <laughs> the, 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 the horse race we call, uh, you know, Harris versus Trump. And I, you know, as Catholics, we get to sort of the, the added bonus of being able to watch uh, whatever is going to happen uh, with the synod on synodality and this sort of this second part. And I wonder, you know, anyway, I wanted to pick your brain, maybe, maybe pick up some threads from your experience last October, and then sort of maybe some things that you're anticipating. And I, in a, and if you don't mind, I would love to pick your brain about, oh, Singapore. Absolutely. you know, Singapore. Is oh sort of yeah. Being, uh... Yeah. I just had an article about that in okay. Catholic old report. So yeah, yeah I'm, I'm yeah. eager to talk about that. Well, so you, do you want to go synod first and then uh, Singapore? Yeah, let's do synod yeah. first. And right. uh, and I want to repeat once again for like the hundredth time, because I constantly <laughs> get emails. Why are you always writing and talking about the synod on synodality? Because it's yeah. important. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's tantamount to saying about somebody, you know, during, if, if there was if there was blogging back in the era of the Second Vatican Council. Yeah. Why are you always talking about the Second Vatican? Well, because it's the most important ecclesiastical event of our time. So, which is interesting, by the way, right? Because, you know, many people have sort of, again, on whatever side, side, you know, you find yourself yeah. on, if you're sort of yeah. pro-Francis and pro-Synod or, or anti-Francis and anti-Synod, basically, um, many people have sort of made the comment that is this a way of calling Vatican III, quote unquote, uh, without calling Vatican III? So I, I I don't, I think that's a good, I think well, that's a good I, way to look I, at You know, it. I think at one point, a couple of years ago, I asked the same question. Mm -hmm. You know, is this maybe liberals have uh, liberals have for a long time dreamed of a Vatican three with the yeah. right pope at the helm to, in a sense, complete the revolution that was ah, started yes. at, yeah. at Vatican in their eyes, the yeah, revolution yeah, yeah. that was started at Vatican two uh, and, and failing to achieve that. Maybe this is just Vatican three light and without yeah. the without the pesky nuisance of all the bishops of the world being there well, with, yeah. with the advantage of having a curated group of people. Yeah, it's so interesting, you know, about that, you know, that 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 with if if you would call, you know, a I guess a regular synod or 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 a, or a council, um, you know, you you don't get to pick who shows up, um, you know, for instance, at a um, at, at a at a at a council, um, because you know you the bishops and cardinals from around the world show up, you know, so that's right. Where, whoever you are, you are, and that's who shows up. Whereas this has been a little bit more of a curated thing, hasn't it? Yes, curated, smaller, more manageable. Everybody sits around round tables. And I know this because I talk to the people who go, who, some of the people who go to the Synod, you know, and there's a facilitator. I like to call him the commissar because uh, I know one person at the count, you know, who was at the Synod said that the facilitator is not supposed to, in a sense, channel the conversation in certain right. directions. It's right. just supposed to make sure that everybody is heard and all that mm -hmm. and to be a kind of stenographer. Uh, but the facilitators intervene and the facilitators. So, yeah, so it is a very much a curated conversation. It's very much a controlled conversation uh, around, you know, just the fact that they're around round tables, Kale. I mean, come on. You know, it, it struck me. I've seen the pictures, of course. And I believe it's in the Paul the Sixth. Um, uh, the Paul the Sixth Hall. Yeah. Hall, yeah. 
and uh you know which is not my favorite place i must say it, it's kind well of, it's grotesque ever you've it, seen it's it grotesque. right you know, yeah boy, oh, I've been it's there architecturally grotesque yeah, yeah. oh my god yeah. it's awful it's so funny yeah uh and not funny actually it's just kind of awful and but what, what, what strikes me I, you know i saw pictures of it it reminds me of when i go to one of these educational conferences and we're all sitting around these like lunch tables essentially and you know it doesn't <sighs> it doesn't quite have the 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 feel or the weight of you know you've seen those old pictures of the second vatican council and like the entire oh yeah of saint peter's like they're on these sort of risers and it's like you know there's with something the, kind of with the miters yeah, up in the air yeah yeah there's something like kind of impressive about the, the 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 whole thing however it is your feelings about the you know the thing but it was it was impressive it was like it was clearly ecclesial in its in its uh, vibe, and it, you know, that's a, a kid, a word the kids use these days, you know, but it's, it's well, very ecclesial in, it, in its sort of, it, it's all in its style and its, and its import. It's grounding and it's yeah. grounding. Yeah. It was grounded in something substantive. Mm -hmm. Whereas sitting around circular tables with a, just, a small group uh, table leader, I know, it, it all right, just, it doesn't, it, it just, guy, but it's, oh, yeah, yeah. you know what? It just conjures up anybody who works in the real world at a real job yeah. knows that that's a nightmare. <laughs> OK, as, as I said in my Catholic World Report article yes. on this, right, that when you have meetings about meetings yeah. and you have a committee set up to discuss committees and develop flowcharts about making flowcharts, yeah. this is the stuff of office nightmares mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. that nobody ever in their right mind wants to attend when they work in a corporate office or something like that. You, yeah. you realize what a monumental waste of our time. Yeah. This is, you know, what's so uh, funny in my experience of those things, it's sort of, it's typically, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's by management for management in a really interesting sort of way, you know, for those of us rank and file folks who go and like do the thing every day, you know, it, it, it really does feel like a waste of time. And I don't mean that there's no yeah. good that can come from plenary sessions of, you know, but it, man, it really almost always feels like it's for management by management. In other words, like you know, if you're, yeah. if you've ever had to go to a, you know, like a sexual harassment seminar or, a, you know, best practices seminar or you whatever, fill in the blank, it always feels a little bit dehumanizing and it feels a little silly. And it feels like I'm doing something right now so that somebody else above me can click a box saying we did the thing. That's so, exactly right. That's exactly yeah, right. As yeah. I said to Rodney Hauser in a podcast last week, mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the ways in which the outward appearance of democracy oh, can actually yeah. be a veiled form of yeah, bureaucratic yeah. totalitarianism. Totally. You, yeah. you simply create these layered mm -hmm. levels of mm -hmm. uh, anonymity, these yeah. layered levels of denial, uh, plausible deniability, mm -hmm. all just so management can check a box. So in the case of the Synod on Synodality, my point would be that what's going on here is a faux exercise in democratic listening. It's a faux exercise in listening. That's why I constantly point out it's curated listening. It's controlled and facilitated listening along a certain path. And they don't listen to voices that they don't want to hear. Those voices are just automatically dismissed. This is simply in place from the round tables all the way up to, to, to the final statements so that so that the powers that be in the Vatican, who are now going to be making decisions about ecclesial structures and teachings going forward, can say, well, we the synod. This happened at the and people talked about it. Well, we were listening. We were listening, church. The Holy Spirit you know, was speaking. You know, yeah, it's nonsense. No, that's a good insight. I really like that. I, I kind of sort of it's like dispersed authority, right? So that no one, yeah. no one is no one is sort of left explicitly holding the bag. You could say, well, you know, we consulted the people and the people spoke. Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, we called the Senate and and we sourced, you know, multiple information streams, and you know, this is what you know the consensus <laughs> was, right? And you know, consensus is really um uh fabricated right it's not that's right it, it's not real nor is it the the exercise i mean it's just so ironic of course uh, and i don't even really mean to come across this nasty about it but you know it's just it's ironic to me uh, that a church which is predicated on authority i mean that is the point of the ecclesial structure is the is the meeting out of authority you know god's authority on planet earth right and 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 to see a collection of people who have been, I mean, let's be blunt here, Larry, you know, they've been chosen by God uh, and chosen by those who are chosen by God in order to uh, be sort of the mediation of grace in the world. And yet here we are, we're in a cafeteria, essentially, 
right? And we are we are being facilitated to at you know 10, 12 person uh tables. And and like what are we even talking about? I mean, what are we? I mean, is you know, again, yeah. I, I keep myself a check here, but I mean, are we talking about the, you know, what you and I might call like the existential crisis of unbelief in the church? I don't think they're talking about that. Instead, no, we're talking not. about um things in an outmoded, worn out idiom of um, you know, now 60 year style. It's just strange. Yeah. It's just strange. How do we become more of a listening church? But I, I think that you nailed it in, in focusing on authority. Everybody agrees, right, that we live in an era of a bloated papacy, yeah. of, of an inflated sense of papal supremacy and, and all that. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And so everybody agrees, yes, we needed a more diffuse uh, authority structure in the Catholic Church. Fine. So let's focus on that. Let's make that the focus of the Synod on Synodality precisely reform of the relationship between the Pope and the say, National Episcopal Conferences and the relationship of bishops to laity and so forth. Let's what talk about, about that. Can, can, but that's can, not I, what they're talking right, about. Right, but anyway, right. go ahead. Yeah. And I was just going to add to that that list. I think that's a that's a worthy list. But I think, you know, something that I've been chewing on a, a good bit the last couple of years is just a sort of a reworking <clears> of <throat> the relationship between the Pope and his sort of public function. Um, you know, uh, you know, a reworking, a reimagining of the Pope uh, and sort of what he's for. Um, you know, we've been, you know, we've been sort of in this age of of, of sort of celebrity Pope um, for better and for worse. And some of those men have worn it lightly and some of them have worn it heavily. I get the sense that not everybody understands you know, like when you become Pope, right? I mean, this is you know, maybe, you know, for your listeners, this is pretty obvious stuff, but I do think it, it's worth invoking here and, and maybe even repeating. But, you know, you do change your name. You know, like if if, if, if Larry goes to Rome uh, at, a, at a conclave uh, as, you know, Larry, you know, you and you get chosen to become the Pope, you know, you're not Larry anymore. And and no, I think that no. there's a real and I think that there's a real you take on a insight. new name, you know. Right. I think if I were ever insight. made pope, by the I would take the name Innocent Urban. I like, that. I, like <laughs> that. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So so in other words, right, you know, and again, you don't even know this, right? I mean, but there's yeah. always the significance. We see this in scripture, and we see this, of course, um played out in, in, in the church. And, and this is sort of where it comes from, right? Is that you know, uh, a name change change signifies, you know, that you are no longer that person. You know, it's funny because like in, in in trans discourse, you know, you'll talk about, well, I, you know, I used to be Bill, but now I go by Martha. And if you if you say my old name, you're dead naming. Me, right. And there's there's a, there's an interesting kind of recognition that, no, like I'm a new person. Now, at least that's the claim. And I and I, yeah, and I like yeah. that about the papacy. I like <clears throat> the fact that he's no longer, you know, um, Jorge Bergoglio. Um, he's Pope Francis because it, it's a recognition that you are performing yes. really and i mean that without derision but you are performing a role you know you are taking on something it, it's 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 no longer you and i get the sense and now of course you have to live out that role in the way that you in the particular person live out that role i do understand that but it's no longer about you and and i just sort of wonder if if that's been something that that has maybe been forgotten i think it has been forgotten I think it's it's become more focused on the personality of, of that man, that particular individual, rather than on on the office. Um, but, yeah, I think the question of authority is an important one here, because, like I said before, everybody agrees we need a, a, a less centralized papacy and so on while maintaining a strong papacy. So that's the trick, because we trick, do need yeah. a strong papacy. Well, we why? Need... So steel man that for me. I think you're right, of course, but I want well, to it's a, it. Well, I, I wrote an article in CWR that actually got some blowback, even from some of my friends, you know, where I said, where I said, hey, look, all the trend right now because of Pope Francis is for very conservative Catholics to say, well, one good thing that's come out of all this is a diminishment of the papal office because we've just placed way too much emphasis on the papal office and so on, to which I say, be very, very, very careful about about your desire to diminish the papal office, because in point of fact, historically, over the past five, six, seven hundred years, despite the sins of the papacy, despite its excesses, despite its mistakes, it is precisely the fact that the Catholic Church has had a strong central authority. 
grounded on the rock of Peter, that we did not become Anglicans, that we did not go the way of Anglicanism, Episcopalianism, mainline Protestantism. We didn't simply give in to the centrifugal forces of modernity and splinter into a million ideological facets, right? right. We had, and, 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 and so people, rock star papacy, celebrity papacy. I agree with you. Some have worn it lightly, some heavily, to which I would say, I mean, John Paul was the great hero of my life, even though he made mistakes, and we can talk about that. But the fact is, what's so bad, in a sense, about having a pope be a if the pope is orthodox and theologically sound, isn't it actually a good thing that the leader of the Catholic Church is one of the most charismatically recognized people in the world and millions and millions and millions of people want to go to a papal mass wherever he visits? Isn't that better than wanting to go to, say, a rock star concert or, you know, or Burning Man or whatever? So I would say let's 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 not throw the baby out with the bathwater here. I think we need a strong papacy, but that's not to say that there aren't tweaks we can't make to this where the Pope, the Vatican doesn't have to make every decision. Maybe local yeah. nations can appoint their own yeah. bishops, that kind of thing. But once again, so that's not what the Synod is focusing on. Right. The, the Synod instead keeps wanting to dredge up other issues in order to change church teaching which leads me to believe that the issue is authority, but they want to undermine it, that they want to, in a sense, they want to, they want to, in a sense, diminish the papacy, not to decentralize authority in the church and spread it around a bit. They want to diminish authority for the sake of diminishing authority to court across the board. Yeah. You know, I think a, an interesting sort of philosophical divide, you know, kind of one of those litmus tests that, you know, you know, I can ask you a question. It kind of tells me where you stand, you know, and in part, I think it has to do with, you know, where do you recognize the locus of authority? Is it inside the person or is it um, external to the person? And, and it seems to me, you know, when I listen to the folks who are either part of the synod or are, you know, uh, cheerleading the synod from, from, from the sidelines, you know, that the sense that, you know, ask the people because the people know, and, and I don't want to be a complete jerk about this, but that's not the way this thing works, right? You know, the, <laughs> right. the, 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 the claims of the, the Roman Catholic church are not that its members know things, right? It's that it's, it's, it's not that at all. In fact, it seems to be the claim is that it, it has been blessed and entrusted with divine revelation you know, nothing short of that. And, yeah. and, and, and that, that divine revelation um, uh, <clears throat> returned uh, from death and gave Peter the keys to the kingdom. I mean, let's just be blunt about the claim. Okay. So this is not because Peter had a particular insight into the nature of reality. I think he gained that of course, and grace yeah. is real and it formed him. And I think he grew into his papacy, if you'll allow me that. Um, but, you know, to suggest that um, uh, you know, it, it's some sort of personal oracle. And then that he can say like, well, you know, uh, you know, the truth kind of resides in each and every one of us. And it's like, okay, well, what do we mean by that? You know, I, I'm yeah, fine with yeah. that on some level, right? We're all made in the image and likeness of God. And we all are granted, you know, certain insights into the nature of things be, be, by, by virtue of that. But, you know, that's not, um, that's not authority. Not the way that we understand authority. Right? No, but I think that the the emphasis you place just there on revelation is mm -hmm. sort of key mm -hmm. to what it means to be a Catholic and that we've been vouchsafed this revelation that we have to preserve. And that's what tradition, traditio simply means to hand on, to pass right. on that's what right. it is we've. Re now, it doesn't mean we have to slavishly hand it on. We yeah. can creatively hand it on and we have an obligation to do so. But I think it's instructive in this regard. Well, look so, at so, look, just 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 one well, second. I want, to, I want to show you an example of that, right? So, for the last uh, seventeen years, no, this is my eighteenth year. So, the last eighteen years here, I have been entrusted with um, teaching my kids, um, uh, you know, two sections of a class, and and the first, uh, let's call it three weeks of class, we read Dante's Inferno. Right. So my I understand my role uh, as a in, in, in the tradition, right, is to sort of pass on uh, an experience of Dante's Inferno in, in this case. Um, and so um, I don't slavishly, you know, pass it on like without thought. You know, I, I'm actively engaged in helping right. kids translate Dante into their own idiom so that they can exactly. understand it. Right. So I think that's a way in which you can understand a kind of dynamic tradition. So, for instance, the way that I taught the class this morning, you know, Canto uh, 20, uh, 
actually, I teach Canto 20 tomorrow. But anyway, you know, I'm preparing Canto 20. Beautiful Canto. It's it's Malbold. It's it's really where the the where the Inferno really just comes alive. It's just amazing. You know, the way that I'm going to teach that tomorrow morning is probably different than the way I did it three years ago. Probably different than the way I did it last year, or ten years ago, or fifteen years ago, or seventeen years ago. Right. The book remains the same. I mean, what I'm passing <clears throat> on in this yeah. case is is just a book. I know that the the Magisterium is more than just a book. I don't want to fall down that rabbit hole, but but the idea is this thing that I have received, right? I am passing on and I continue to pass this on in a kind of creative and 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 dynamic understanding of that's tradition, right. not slavishly. So anyway, I just wanted it's to get creative that fidelity, baby. Yeah, it's and that's, right. every like that. that's I why like I mean that. the church, the church is magister teacher yeah, that's so great that's all so right great. and as a teacher it has to interpret for each age but i, I was going to say because I, I think that's very true along those very lines in terms of vouchsafing revelation I mean, go to the great scene in matthew 16 where peter is commissioned by christ what yeah. what provokes this jesus asks a question who do you say that i am in other words there's a question of what what is it that, uh, that has been revealed here and peter chimes in and says well you're the christ you're the son of the living god who and told, it's basically it's like who told you that right and, yeah, exactly <laughs> right? Right, jesus right. immediately recognizes yeah. that this is not something knowing peter that peter came up with on his own right. okay right. he recognizes the fact that peter has been, in a sense, inspired by the, his right. heavenly father That's right. That's with right. this idea. In other words, he's been given revelation. Yeah. He's perceived properly the revelation of God in Christ with God's aid. So then yeah, that, Jesus that. gives him the permit, you know, his keys. But if you look at, we just read this at church last week, right? If yep. you look at Mark's version of this, there's no mention of the keys or anything. It doesn't mean that that's not valid, but yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. as soon as Jesus says, yeah, flesh and blood doesn't give it. He says, yes, I am that. And I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to, you know, so many words. I'm and, going and to and Peter's like, heck, no, you're not. This will not happen to you, Lord. Yeah. And Jesus turns and says, Boom. get behind me, Satan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom. So Peter goes from, OK, the Heavenly Father revealed this to you, to thinking like a man, to right. thinking like a first yeah. century Jew who's still expecting a political kingdom to be put in where yeah. Jesus, Jesus isn't going to get his ass kicked by the Romans. He's going to kick the Romans ass. Right. All right. That's what's going to happen, right. Lord. That's right. And so Jesus, I said, no, you're thinking like, say, so I would say with regard to then, you know, in the church today, we would look out and say, wherever the church thinks with revelation, which in this case means faithful to her own teaching and so forth, she is thinking with the mind of God. She's making the mind of the church is simpatico right. with the mind of God, right. wherever so, so, she departs from the cross and starts speaking a soft evangel of accommodation to the yeah. world. Get behind me, Satan. Right. No, I love that. And so so then so then let's just be you know, clear or, 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 you know, maybe literal here. You know, what is. A Christian, a Roman Catholic Christian, what is a Christian to listen to exactly? You see, and this is sort of gets at yeah. the heart of my issue with this, this, you know, this constant patter about a listening church, a listening church, a listening church. If you meant a listening church, like listen to the Holy Spirit, then, you know, first in line right here, like, let's go, like, let's listen yeah. to what, what, what the scriptures in the church has to teach me, uh, a lowly pilgrim. But if, if, if you're asking me to pay attention to, you know, to listen to, um, and again, I, you know, whatever whatever the guy to my right or the left is is saying like i'm 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 a little more skeptical about that like i just am because i spend a lifetime listening to people on my left and on my right and like you know sometimes there's some good stuff but there's an awful lot of garbage too and like no. it just like wow anyway you know so going now you, you know you're going you you went last october and and, yeah. and and what do you expect um, to to see here um, when you go? Maybe in, in in sort of reference, what was it like last time? And like, what do you expect to see? Well, before we get to that, I want to come back oh. to our last point oh. still because we'll okay. get to the what we see in a second. Where I have a question for you, t former teacher to current teacher, which yeah. is, do you do student presentations in your class? Do you have student presentations every in your now class? and again? Yes, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> well, anyway. I see this as somewhat analogous to the listening church, right? Because yeah. I, when I was at DeSales, we were told you should always have a student presentation component in all of your class. Look, I would, I was always have it on my syllabus, and then immediately yeah. tell the students we're not going to do yeah, this. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I would say to the students because I'd rather gouge out my eyes with knitting needles than sit and listen to a student presentation. And it's not that wasn't an insult to the students. Yeah. It was simply a way of saying you're spending 50 grand a year 
not to be right. you know, the blind leading the blind. Yeah. Right. I'm not here to teach a course in speech, whatever mm -hmm. speech 101. Right. I'm here to teach a course in theology. Yeah. All right. And you're going to get what I have to offer, which is exponentially of several orders of magnitude better than anything a student present. He goes, well, they'll learn better if they're present. No, because half the time you have to correct what they know, what they just said, totally wrong. Sorry, yeah, but what you know, Susie it, said of it, wrong. So the yeah, point it's is, a version, it's a version. What are, I, in other words, I'm validating your question. What are yeah. we listening to? Right. Yeah, it's, it's a, you know, and and look, I, I like a good seminar, you know, a good back and forth. And, you know, hey, Johnny, well, that's like, what different. Do you, what, yeah. right, what do you think of passage X? And, oh, you know, Jenny, what do you think of passage Y? Like, yeah. that, that, that's good stuff. I'm trying to, you know, engage the students. But but I'm not really asking them, like, like I'm not asking it because I want to, you know, in other words, it sounds terrible, right? But I'm not asking them because i asking that question because I'm like, I, hey, like, do you know what this is? I'm asking like, hey, Jimmy, can you articulate what Dante is saying in this passage? Exactly. In other right. words, a, it, if you have a seminar on, say, Canto 20 in, yeah. in Dante, you have a yeah. seminar on that. You have a common text. Yeah. You expect everybody to have read it. You expect Correct. everybody to have a, a sort of modicum of understanding of what right. it is. Your job is then to elevate the conversation. Right. But then if somebody there says, well, you know, I didn't read it and I really don't like it. You say, OK, well, then just sit and yeah, don't yeah, say yeah. anything. Yeah, you're yeah, you're yeah. Done. you're not part of the seminar. Yeah. But we now treat these listening sessions as, as this sort of spiritual egalitarianism where whatever mm -hmm. emotive thought comes to somebody you know, it gets written down. Oh, the Holy Spirit yeah. is speaking through Zabubala over here, yeah. you know, and, and, and so we better write this down. This is the spirit talking. Yeah, well, so okay, can I ask you just a quick question then about that? I mean, what do you think the theology of the Holy Spirit is for the coordinators and the facilitators of the Synod on Synodality? I mean, what, do, what, is, the, what is your sense of their appreciation of the third person of the Trinity? As we I think there's, as well, I don't, I don't think they have a deep or profound sense of Trinitarian theology at all, okay. or a sense of theology in general. What they have is, is a, if they have a theology at all, it's a kind of theology of, of grace and revelation and the movement of the Spirit uh, that says, okay, there's revelation in scripture and tradition. That's kind of like privileged, I guess, mm -hmm. but we need to open up to engage the world, to see the movement of that spirit in all kinds, so that God is revealing himself in very direct and revelatory ways in the thoughts and opinions of average people sitting around tables so I just don't know what the limit. Things. So so I hear what there's you're no limiting concept. I was it's just, just going to ask you, like, what's the limiting principle for that kind of thing? Because again, no, you know, there Larry, isn't any. You you and I are human beings. We we talk to our people on the left and our people on the right all every day, right? And you're sort of like every anything Billy says is yeah. Like like what like what are hey, we look, talking about? Yeah. If all they're saying is we're trying to discern where people are spiritually. So we want everybody to speak so we can get an accurate sense of what we're up against here. Mm -hmm. All right. What is it that average Catholics actually think and believe? Fine. That's that's a that's a noble exercise. Let's do that. Let's figure it out. All right. But that's not what they're saying. Oh, at least at least in total, this is another big part of it that is saying this is you read Massimo Fagioli, read Austin Ivory. They Massimo Fagioli especially went on and on and on about how in these listening sessions, the church for the first time in ages is listening to the census fidelium, is listening to the movement of the Holy Spirit and the voices of average people. This is a kind of vox populi heresy that you ask me, what is it is in their brain? This is what's in their brain. It's a it's a kind of enthusiasm, almost an old fashioned kind I of mean, it's, wow, enthusiasm, like in that Methodist type way. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're using the word technical. I like that. Um, and the well, Ronald Knox enthusiasm. Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. You know, well. I just I, you know, it's really hard for me to resist asking a kind of mean question, which is like what's really going on? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what's really oh, going well, on? Oh, that's not a main question. I think that's the question of the hour. You asked okay. me, okay, go to the next section. What do I expect when yeah. I get to Rome? Well, what I expect is more of the same that we saw last year. Uh, and well, so, so, you know, it's been a long well, year, it, right? it, it, Once yeah. again, a, a, just simply a group of people sitting around chairs in round tables, spinning their wheels in endless conversation, talking hot button issues to death. Okay. okay. So you asked me, what is really going on? What is really going on, I think, is an attempt 
to keep certain controversial issues alive and afloat by talking them to death under the appearance of democratic egalitarian conversation. In other words, I just said in a previous podcast, look, the, the, the Senate has took off the table all these hot button issues, but have established all these new committees right. that the Pope has put on his own special people to discuss the hot button issues, de- women, deacons, contraception, you know, LGBTQ, all that stuff. So my point is this. You don't keep talking to death issues that you think are settled. Has the Pope established any committees that are adjuncts to the Synod to discuss the, the Nicene Creed, the Trinity, whether or not Jesus was really God, whether or not murder is right or wrong, or whether the death penalty is right or wrong? Okay, no. I mean, you don't talk to death issues that you think are resolved because it's pointless. You talk to death issues that you want, at least at the very least, want to keep the appearance that these are open questions, that these are questions about which reasonable Catholics can disagree. And we need to, therefore, get on with this conversation. So that's to me what's going on. The, The Senate is a stalking horse for keeping certain conversations alive that previous pontificates have supposedly settled. Right. And it seems that the the the, the panoply of, of acceptable topics that can be listened about or two um, yeah. all seem to sort of cluster in the same direction, don't they? Secularity. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, sort of a kind of a, uh, a capital L liberalist um, secularity. It's like they're all there. I mean, nobody's sitting there being like, you know, we we really should um, listen to the Holy Spirit about, you know, what the Holy Spirit might tell us about slavery. Like, I'm not hearing yeah. that. Like, yeah. And yeah. I'm not advocating it for it. Full disclosure, of course, it's absurd. But, you know, you feel like you have to say those things sometimes. You know, but it's like, like, well, especially when you're more conservative, because then it gets yeah, taken right. out of Kanto. Oh, right. Kel Zeldin said Zeldin. we can still talk about slavery, a typical reactionary right winger. Right, right, right. That you know that kind of thing. You know, so it's like you know that so that even those things that that the synod is sort of allowed to 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 listen to slash about are yeah. a sort of a very specific cluster of of um, initiatives, uh, topics, ideas um, that, like you said, have been you know summarily said no to uh, in in, yeah. in the span of the last hundred years. Let's call it. Um, so yeah, why? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, so sorry. okay, so you know, so you go there, and and were there any surprises for you last year? You know, so you show up, and you know, Rome's great. Rome in October must be amazing. I would imagine Rome in the fall oh, is amazing. Story. It's yeah. the best yeah. time to be yeah. in Rome, yeah. October. Yeah, yeah, it's magnificent. So, so okay, so you go there, and you would you meet people, you see people. I mean, I know you're not in the hall, but you're talking to people. I would imagine, right? No, yeah, I, I'm. I don't have press credentials, so I don't go to the uh, news conferences every day. Press, mm-hmm. no, nobody is allowed into the synod hall, okay. uh, and synod members are told that they really shouldn't talk about it outside of the hall, but they do. Wait, wait, so that's wait. why that's why I say I'm over there covering the synod because I do yeah. have a lot of people that I know who are participants in the synod, yeah. and Good. what the, and this is true of every you know quote unquote jur- I'm not a journalist, but every journalist or per- a pundit that's over yeah. there covering things, they all know people at the synod. And what you end up doing is sitting in a cafeteria in some piazza, some trattoria yeah. in a piazza yeah. in Rome at night, over a grappa and whatever, yeah. talking about what it is that they perceived about the sin. And it's all off the record, so you can't quote them, but you get a sense of it. You get yeah, a yeah. sense of their frustration of what's really going on and yeah, so on. Yeah. And so that's that's what I expect, in a sense, once again, more of the same, the expression of great frustration uh, that it's an exercise in futility in so many ways. Also, one of the things I'll be doing over there is simply networking with other people that are over there writing about these sure. same things, people like Jonathan Liedel of the National Catholic Register, okay. Jade Hendricks uh, of, of the What We Need Now substack, Diane Montagna of the Register, George oh, yeah. Weigel will be there, yeah. uh, Robert Royal. <laughs> I mean, yeah. just the a crew, lot of yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the crew, the crew, and you get there and, you know, and this is what you do with this. And then you all write articles and so on. Uh, we'll see what happens. And then you do like to attend all of the, anything that's public, like the opening outdoor mass to the Senate and so on. So, you know, that, so were, that's, there, were there surprises last year for you? You know, um, yeah, 
so you know, um, so, you know yeah, we, yeah. So talk to me just a little bit about that because, uh, you know, again, I want to sort of make this a sort of a historical marker. This is what I was thinking before I got there. This is what I think after I was there. So anyway, you know, uh, one one of the surprises to me were the number of uh, Orthodox bishops and oh, okay. uh, lay lay people uh, yeah. that were that were actually participants in this city. Now they don't. What you find out in talking to them is that they're not in the majority, that they are a distinct minority. So there's a clear essence of tokenism sure. uh, with regard to their presence. But nevertheless, you are encouraged by the fact that they are there yeah. uh, and that they are actually willing to speak out on the Synod floor. Mm -hmm. And I thought that maybe their voices, that they would be, in a sense, afraid, especially the lay people or whatever, to say anything. Uh, but they they weren't. I, I was very encouraged by the fact from what I heard was that the, the more orthodox people were not only at the Synod, but were speaking out. The other yeah. thing th that surprised me was I, I did meet some Africans uh, who were participants who made the very astute observation that as far as they were concerned, that despite this pope's constant emphasis on going to the peripheries, Mm -hmm. uh, of just how unbelievably first world ocentric the synod is. Uh, th they would say issues of LGBTQ and women's ordination and all this kind of all these sexual. These are first world bourgeois yeah. preoccupations. Yeah. These are not the preoccupations of Africa the, at all on any level. Mm -hmm. OK, and what we want to talk about would have more to do with the economic injustices of the Western yeah. world toward the, the, the global North, towards the global South yep. and so on. Uh, various issues that are still central to the global South in terms of poverty, access to clean water, access to education, uh, non-corruption in government. And, 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 you know, you get the whole picture. Yeah, uh, these are not the issues of the Synod. The Synod are how how can we reach out to the bisexuals? Mm -hmm. By the way, what does it mean for the church to be more inclusive of, I mean, LGBTQ, B, bisexual? Well, okay. what well, does I, it mean for the church to be more inclusive of bisexuals exactly? Right, right. Well, you know, I, I think that this goes back to, you know, a, a, a long term conversation that we have had about um, the need for a maybe an assertion, a reassertion, a rearticulation of basic Catholic anthropology. Right. Because the, the the sort of the alphabet, um, you know, stuff is uh, it, it completely at odds with um, our set, our, you know, we would call a proper anthropology, you know, so that there's no such thing as an L or a G or a P or a T or Q or an I or whatever it is. Right. You know, we're we're human beings made in the image yeah. the of God. And so, uh, it, you know, uh, it is a confusion uh, between um, identity and behaviors. And I think the 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 rush uh, to conflate those two things, uh, especially in a lot of the sort of the press in the Synod on Synodality and around the Synod on Synodality is peculiarly vexing for those of us who understand that yeah. there is no such thing as, you know, a you know bisexual person, right? Now, before people freak out, of course, I know that there are people who have sex with men and women. I get it. I'm not an idiot. OK, but that is not who they are. Um, that is what they do. Right. And, yeah. and, and, and yet we continually hear about, you know, a, a you know, again, using your example, a bisexual person. Well, um, that's false anthropology. That's not who that person is. That's right. And 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 and, and, and the, for the church to sort of give in to that kind of nomenclature is i think really uh I mean, unfortunate but but bad like let's just be blunt like it's bad it's not good it's counter to um you know uh, to the catholic vision of reality utterly that's what it's designed to do uh to undermine all of that but i do think there's one sign of encouragement. Ask me what could be different i said you know that's gonna be more of the same well, maybe I misspoke a little bit because as I'm sitting here thinking about it, I realized that, you know, <laughs> the instrumentum laboris that came out, the document to guide the the, the, the conversations, uh -huh. unlike last year, this year's instrumentum laboris does not contain anything in it, like I said, about all of these hot button issues mm. uh, that they've been relegated to these sidebar committees. 
So my hope is for study or whatnot, is that the yeah, just for further study. My yeah. hope is that maybe this time around the the synod will not focus on those issues at all. Maybe this time around, those issues will be relegated to the sidebar conversations and the synodal participants will actually hopefully maybe hmm. focus on true synodal restructuring of the church in hmm. some fashion or another. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? That's I mean, so you know, to put a more positive spin on it, maybe maybe something good will happen. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do I expect something good to happen? Nah, I don't know. Uh, to me, the best thing that can happen is the thing's going to die with a whimper. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me to podcast it 10 years from now. What do you think people will think of synodality? And I'll say, I don't think they're going to be thinking about synodality yeah. to me. I, I think it's but I could be wrong about that, too. But Anyway, so maybe we should move well, on well, to maybe just just Go real ahead. quick before we move on to Singapore. I mean, what would have to happen for it to be something that would be remembered 10 years from now? Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Well, something like we remember Vatican II, for better or for worse, because it changed the liturgy in a radical way. You know, yeah. now we can eat meat on Fridays and yeah, yeah, nuns right. took off their habits and right. whatnot. OK, so those are tangible things that average people could look at and say, well, that's what happened. And yeah, I remember that I was alive then. Yeah. All right. So the only thing that I would say that we might remember the synod on the synods on synodality is if we really do get, for example, the ability of, say, national Episcopal conferences to appoint their own bishops. Yeah. Be, can you imagine, Larry? Can you imagine the revolution? And I mean, I, that would be amazing for the United States to pick its own bishops. Yeah. Poland to pick its own bishops yeah. with the Vatican still having some kind of in other words, so that the Pope isn't reduced to the Archbishop of Canterbury, you know, right. uh, that the Pope can, under strict canonical rules, intervene in, yeah. in certain and say, uh, no, here's why that person cannot be a bishop. I, mean, the, I, I I'm going to veto. the Pope, in other words, gets a certain veto power. Yeah, I mean, the power shift in something like that is more than I can I think, imagine, like, honestly, that, you know, that it would be, you know, all of this. So again, so ironic historically, right, Larry, that all of this power that has been uh, subsumed into the centralized authority in the Vatican City, all of that administrative power, all of that power has been flowing from the from the outlands into the capital, so to speak, for 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 years and years and years and years, and for that to be reversed, and then all of a sudden, man, the USSCCB or what? I think I think I got that USCCB would all of a yeah. sudden become real important, right? Yes, it would. You know, in the in yes. the version in Mexico, and the version in you know in Germany, and the version in we're all over the place. All of a sudden, all of this energy that gets frankly, shipped to Rome and kind of swallowed by the blob of Rome, all of a sudden it becomes incredibly important. You know, that could be, honestly, that would be uh, a legitimate uh, game changer in terms of the way that we understand and see church happen. I mean, that would be. Yeah, I think exciting. even very, very conservative theologians would look and say, yeah, we have a hyper centralized bloated papacy uh not in terms of doctrinal authority but mm -hmm. the fact that right now i mean if, if the average catholic understood how centralized the church's bureaucratic apparatus is in terms of rome and curial dicastery and those offices and the fact is the curial offices are corrupt as hell uh, and 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 it's just a lot of gossipy, backstabbing, infighting, mm -hmm. turf conscious, mm -hmm. bureaucratic little apparatchiks sitting in their epicene behind their epicene desks. It's just it's insane. Yeah. All right. And so, yeah, I think it'd be very, very healthy instead of having a group of like eight bishops sitting you know, in Rome deciding who's going to be bishop all over the world yeah. to actually have National Episcopal Conference choosing their own bishops. I think that one single reform of the church's structure. If that's all that came of the synod and synodality, then we'd remember it fondly. But and we would say amazing. that is a step forward. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, and the reason why I said it was ironic is that in theory, that was one of the things that the second Vatican council wanted to do, which was to make bishops less of a, a kind of branch manager type yes. and rather someone with his own authority within his own diocese to do the kind yes. of shepherding work uh, that would make a lot of sense. So yeah, that would be a, a real reversal of the polarity. I mean, that would really be a, a, a polar change 
um, in terms of uh, yeah, the way the church goes it would. about its business. One other thing I think that the synod and synodality should look at, and it hasn't, it hasn't even touched it. If I were Pope for a day, mm-hmm. the first thing I would do by mode appropriate and decree is to dissolve and abolish the Vatican Bank uh, uh, and, uh, and to make the Vatican deposit its financial resources into normal Italian or Swiss or German or whatever, normal yeah, banks that have normal oversight, oversight. and normal transparency. Yeah. How many decades and decades and decades now have we had one massive financial scandal after another, all pertaining to investments? In, and the fact is the Vatican Bank launders money yeah. uh, for nefarious yeah. purposes. What in the hell is the yeah. church doing in the money laundering business? That's right. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and I know that most people, you know, believe that the the, the biggest scandal in the church in, in our lifetime has been, um, you know, the, the sex abuse scandal. And they're right. I'm not, certainly not here to argue about that. But make no mistake, those two are deeply intertwined. They are. And people say, well, you need an independent papacy, which means the Vatican needs its own independent banking system. The, the, the problem is the banking system, the, the Vatican has already is not completely independent. In the last year of, of Pope Benedict's papacy, do people understand that the banking agencies of Europe cut out the Vatican City State's ATM privilege? In other words, you Amazing. could not get money out of a Vatican ATM anywhere because Europe shut off the, their ability to do so because of corruption in the Vatican's financial. Now, it eventually came back and they grant, but it was a shot across the bow yeah. Yeah. to the Vatican saying, unless you go, and every single person from, I can't remember the lay person who was put in charge yeah. of it, who just gave a great interview last year to Cardinal Pell, who has yeah. ever tried to pull the, the curtain back on this corruption ends up in deep doo doo themselves uh, done, done away with in a lot right. of ways. Okay. Right. And, and so I think there's another thing where we would remember the Senate on Senate if it engaged in, once again, real reform of problematical structures in the church, which is what this conversation is supposed to be about, not right. whether or not Joey can marry Joey. Right. right OK, right. you know, this right. is insane. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. All right. Well, let's uh, if you don't mind, you know, I, I'd love to, you know, so let's uh, do it. Let's a, do a little it. bit of a kerfuffle. All right. The Pope made a trip to made a trip to Singapore and, you know, fine, great, excellent. You know, you do it, brother. Um, But he gave another. <laughs> I don't even know how to characterize it. He gave another kind of off the cuff, off the script, back and forth at an interfaith dialogue in which he said something about paths to God and there being many ways. How do you understand this from a from a sort of a, a, a literal standpoint, like what actually happened on the ground. And then let, maybe let's talk a little bit about sort of this. this well, effect. it's the problem is it's part of a package of things over the okay. course of many years that the Pope has said, the first being his signing off on the Abu Dhabi, the famous Abu Dhabi declaration where he Which signed a document. Well, the document was published along with some imam, Islamic imam that he was meeting with. And among other things, it said that God, wills will that's right yeah. the the diversity of religions so so, uh, so so pretend like i'm dumb what what does that technically mean that god will the plurality of religions like, what well what it means is mean? that in in the divine economy of salvation in other words the plan that god has introduced into history for wow. redeeming human beings from sin the historical process mm-hmm. that we call this theology the economy of salvation doesn't just include the Christian, the, first the Jewish covenants and the Christian new covenant. Doesn't just include that. That God has also willed, the, the directly willed, that his salvation can happen in and through the very structures of non Christian religions. So, in other words, the idea that all salvation comes through Christ is false, that the salvation comes through these other religions so, as so well. To add my non theological theologian take on this in other words god wants there to be hinduism god yeah. wants there to yes. be 
um you know animism god wants okay all right so so wow that, yeah. that's quite a statement Larry. i mean that, yeah I, you know again i'm so, not a theologian but goodness I, you know. immediately a lot of theologians pounced on the abu dhabi statement and said wait, wait, wait a minute it's one thing the church does teach that truth can be found in other religions right and the I, church and I, has, and I, understand I mean it. this goes all yeah. the way back to, to saint paul at the areopagus right. you know you worship right. the unknown god i'm here to tell you who that is yeah. okay it's Jesus Christ. And the early church fathers spoke of the Logoi Spematicoi, the seeds yep. of the word spread yep. throughout paganism, the spoils of Egypt. Yeah, there's truth in a lot of places. But the church has also always taught that 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 all salvation comes through Christ and yep. then through his church, and that whatever seeds of truth can be found elsewhere are preparations for acceptance of the gospel. And 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 that they're all in some sense insofar as they are true, participating in the truth of Christ. So in some sense, you would say that God's permissive will has allowed for this diversity of religions as a preparatio for the full acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church has never taught that God directly wills, like the Tower of Babel, right, scattering the people of those yeah. different languages. Yeah. He's never willed this directly, that it's good that there's Hinduism. And I'm and the, what this then is, it means that well, we shouldn't try to convert Hindus. We shouldn't try to convert okay. Buddhists, because God's speaking to them through their Hinduism. So, so the Vatican never really completely walked back the Abu Dhabi statement. Uh, well, they did a little uh, bit of a they did a little bit of a curation on this one, didn't they? Can you yeah, explain yeah. to us what, what happened? Well, here? a couple of bishops uh, confronted the Pope and said, "Don't you mean that God's permissive will has allowed for this plurality of religions in preparation for the gospel?" And the Pope kind of said, "Well, yeah, 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 maybe, right? So yeah, permissive yeah, will, right, whatever." So the, yeah. In other words, he was saying, "Stop with your silly." how many angels can dance on the head of a pin kinds yeah, of right, stupid right. theological distinctions. Right, right, right. All right. Well, this is an important distinction, Holy Father. So th then he goes to Singapore, right? And says to the kids, all religions are paths to God. Now, in one sense, that can be interpreted in an orthodox way. Mm -hmm. All religions can be, I mean, you can find God in Hinduism if you're a person of goodwill, but what you are doing is encountering the grace of Christ, whether you realize it or not. Yeah. I mean, and the Pope could have said that I, as the emissary of, of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I'm here to tell you, you worship this, but we believe that you are actually worshiping blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he might have thought that was offensive. But the real problem is he goes on then to compare these various religions to languages, languages. Yeah. It's yeah. like we all have different languages, but it's really all the same point. Right. So, so you know. This is a problem because Love, that amor, that analogy not a, doesn't know. just limp. It's a terrible analogy because no terrible. one would say no one would say, for example, that English is the absolute eschatological inbreak inbreaking of a final and definitive form of communication. Right. right. That is the ground of possibility. The other languages also are forms of communication, but they find their ground of possibility in English. They find their raison d'etre actually fulfilled in English. And that would be a better analogy if you said that. But yeah. of course, nobody would say that because it isn't true. Right. All right. All right, languages right, right, right. and want they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Right. But all languages, French, Spanish, German, Swahili, English. You know, they're all attempts at communication. So there's right. this overarching genus called communication. And then yeah. we ex we achieve that asymptotically, linguistically or whatever. Yeah, that's not what that's not what the Catholic Church teaches. Religions are it's just Period. different grammatical Period. expressions. Full Period. Full stop. Right. That's not what the Catholic Church teaches. Yeah. About. But then the Pope yeah. goes on to say, you know, there's a, a God and we're all seeking after this one God, each in our own languages. Are you kidding me? Yeah. This is not Catholic teaching. Yeah. Sorry, Holy Father. This uh, that's not Catholic yeah. teaching. Yeah. So so, you know, I am, um, as you know, and I know, you know, Chris Altieri well, and I love Chris and I love his work. And, you know, we DM'd back and forth. He's a great guy. I really love great him. guy. But, but his, I didn't his like his take article. on this. Yeah, I was really. So his take on this is, again, as a long time Vaticanista. Right. Um, he's back in the States now, but he spent a long, you know, big chunk of his professional life, you know, in, in, in and around the Vatican. He, you know, sort of called it, Hey, come on, chap. This is, come on, you know, you, you chaps of the world, Zeldins of the world. This is just a, this is just a nothing burger. 
Yeah, and yeah, and uh, I, I, boy, I just really disagreed with that take, Larry. Uh, as yeah, I, I just said that I didn't like the article. That's too strong. I actually did like. It. I mean, Chris, as always, is an intelligent guy and a great writer, yeah. and he makes a good case. But at the end of the day, I, I believe he's wrong. I agree with you. I believe that Chris misses. Normally, he's spot on, but I yeah, think that so. He so what he did though, if, if, if you look at rhetor- sorry for interrupting. What he no, did, go ahead. What he did rhetorically was he he said, you know that this was actually nothing burger, but right. You know, the sort of the second part of the article was the sort of thing that Chris kind of wanted to write about and, and fine, you know, that's what you really want to write about then write about it. But, but I think to, to call it a nothing burger is I think um, unfortunate. And I wonder, and maybe I wanted to get your sort of take on this. Is that a sign just of our, of our general enervation over the course of the decade plus now of these kinds of loose lipped elisions yeah. verbal elisions from the guarantor of of unity and, and orthodoxy yeah i i think it is i think it's a certain exhaustion has kicked in where it's like what are you gonna do yeah uh, i mean yet, yet another problematical statement and uh you know well well and, Chris, and, you know, it, i i have a lot of friends you know i i'm i'm sort of pretty active in you know uh, I would call it, roughly speaking, sort of ecumenical spaces. And so like a lot of times I'm in a room with, you know, a bunch of different types of Christians and non-Christians and some Jews and what, and, you know, all of them have come to me like, hey, like, what, what, what is this, you know, like, what is going on? Yeah. And a lot of these are yeah. sort of very, very faithful Christians and they're serious about the faith. These are not, you know, uh, Reddit atheist types. These are people who take it seriously. And I think they have a uh, you know, these are the kinds of evangelicals and Protestant Christians that have a respect for the papacy, have a respect for Roman Catholicism. Yeah. And I'm telling you, my, my inbox is full of a bunch of people like, Kale, man, like, what is, what is this? Like, you know, this, this is, this sounds bad. And, you know, and, and so, okay, and I dutifully and respectfully answer all of, all of those direct messages and happy to do so. But I, I think that what somebody who is, deeply involved and entrenched in the sort of the specifically Catholic world probably misses the way that his witness is a counter witness is a tarnishing witness in the larger social milieu, you know, and I think that's the part that is um, why I can't just pass this off as a nothing burger. You know, I, you know, I'm sophisticated enough that I can kind of explain this. I can ultimately just say, you know what he said, he said something that's, you know, it's a, it's a bad statement. I mean, I can say all that, but, but the witness part, you know, yeah. and I yeah. can even say like, well, like what he meant to say is he was trying to be nice to these kids. And I get all of those things, but you are not Jorge. You are not <laughs> Jorge. You are Francis. That's right. You know, and 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 you are Pope Francis, and so you need to stop it. I mean, my my opinion is be like, you know, you need to stop it, like trying to be friendly to people. Like again, I'm not saying try to be a jerk with people. That's not what I'm saying. But but in other words, your role is not to get everybody in the room to like you. That's narcissistic uh, behavior, yeah. and therefore not to tell people what you think that they want right. to hear you say. Right. right. To be able to say politely and with a certain decorous niceness you know the hard things and, and look you know, Larry, hard like, things in my in my circles <clears throat> when i'm dealing with my evangelical friends and 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 non-catholic friends you know i will always say something like well i mean obviously i believe that the catholic church holds the fullness of, of truth but i you know i, I, I that, but they know me right like, yeah know, I, I can yeah. say those kinds of things and i'm not like trying to throw bombs and i'm not trying to be a jerk i mean and, and in part you know and i expect them to say like well actually i'm all about you know the five solas of luther i would expect my lutheran friends to say that right and i yeah, can handle yeah. that <laughs> you know i'm gonna I, I can handle that and i think you know this this it, it to to pass this off as a kind of you know nice ecumenism is is i think really underselling it as a form of he just wants people in the room to like him yeah and it also doesn't connect the dots with other things that he has said along the same lines for example like just a few days after the singapore thing gets back to rome and he's giving a talk to a bunch of people and he and he once again said god directly wills yeah the plurality of religions and like god wills the diversity of religion no i'm sorry that's that's not right that's not not a vatican watcher 
You know, I know you're more of a theologian than a sort of politician, you know, a political you know, yeah. watcher of the scene. But it's hard for me to think like he just came home. He could see sort of this blow up of the Singapore stuff. So he doubles down. You double down on that? I mean, is that on? I mean, honestly, part of me is like, like is this is, is he doing this on purpose? It's deliberate. Oh, I, I think you, Dude, I think that you see, this is something that nobody that very few people are bringing up. But I think it's very, yeah. very, very important. Yeah, he had to have known the dust that was kicked up by his comments in Singapore. So he's he's two days, three days back from Singapore and he's in Rome and he says, God wills the, the, the diversity of religions without nuance, without qualification. He doubles down on it again. That was deliberate. It had to be deliberate. And it was a, a an in your face comment to his Absolutely. critics. Yeah. Deal with it. I'm the Pope. Deal with it. Now, I'm I'm going to have Chris Altieri on my podcast, I believe, Tuesday night. Oh, good. So I'm, I, I'm I will to hear I, this. I really. Yeah, am, because you know, I, again, I, I in, in the spirit of fraternity. I mean, like I said, I love. Oh, yeah, we love the guy. Chris, if yeah. you're listening, we love you, buddy, because he's great. But and, and in Chris's defense, here's here's I think to to steel man Chris's argument here. Yeah. Which is why I think it does have some merit, which is yeah. what he's saying is this. OK, all you theology types. Fine. You can yeah, yeah. pounce on these various uh, unfelicitous statements from the Pope and so on. But what I'm here to tell you as a Vaticanist, as somebody who's lived inside the belly of the beast, yeah. that the number one problem of this papacy is governance, is the dereliction of duty with regard yeah. to governing the church. And yeah. that's why he is so heavily focused, Chris, on the Rupnik affair and the sex yeah. scandal yeah. affairs yeah. in general. And he has and, been and fantastic. Boy, yeah. Fantastic and boy, he is on this. not wrong about that. You know, and I and and, and that, yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you reminded me of that, because that 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 was the you know, he sort of opens up the piece talking about the 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 the, the nothing burger of the Singapore thing, because he really wanted to talk about the, the church government. And again, I agree with that stuff. I just think that this thing before the butt actually is important too. Just so yeah, you know and, but it opens up the possibility though, which is this, which is the Pope makes the throws out these little theological Molotov cocktails, <laughs> precisely in order, precisely in order to generate controversy. To what does it do for him? What does it do for him? It takes people's minds off the real problem with his papacy, which is his empowering of sex abusers. Wow. Uh, that that he knows that his Achilles heel is that he has dropped the ball on the sex abuse crisis, aided and abetted people, people like Bishop Zanchetta and others, uh, Zanchetta. I don't know how yeah. you pronounce his name, with you, uh, with you. Uh, you know, uh, rehabilitated McCarrick, like you said, done nothing with regard to Marco Rupnik and so on. This is his great, horrible scandal. And in order to divert attention from that, I'm, I'm going to throw out these little these little incendiary bombs here and there uh, to distract people's attention off of this other thing over here. And I think Chris's article is a way of saying, let's not lose our focus okay, okay. on the fact yeah. that the real problem with this papacy resides right here, not here, here. Okay. Because not a thing that he said in Singapore or in some comment in Rome, to none of it is of a high magisterial level. None of it, 10 seconds after he's dead, and we have a new pope two weeks later, none of that stuff is going to matter. If we get an, you know, a sound, theologically astute pope and so on, it will just be relegated to the dustbin of history. But the great shock to the system of the Catholic Church of our time is the sex abuse scandal. All right. This yeah, is the great the, unresolved we, we, crisis. Yeah. And we tie that, Larry, you know, we, we tie that back to the, the first portion of this conversation, right, which is authority and the nature of it yeah. and the crisis yeah. of it and the destruction of it. I, I think that that uh, you know that really came that has come home to me in in my day to day life as a teacher, as a Catholic teacher at a Catholic school. Um, you know, and, and I've told you this before, um, great school you know, but we're very mainstream, right? You know, so we, we're, yeah. we are not uh, one of these lovely uh, and beautiful sort of uh, uh, rigorously Catholic enclaves that, you know, that, that I've been to and enjoy appreciate. It's a pretty mainstream place. And what I see every day, what I hear every day from students and a lot of times from parents, right. It's just like, yeah, you know, church. No. And, 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 and what they mean by yeah. that is that, the church doesn't have the moral authority to tell me what to do. 
because they didn't have the moral authority to stop predators from eating children yeah and other vulnerable human beings that's true i often and, say okay go ahead go ahead no no no, no. No, finish up. Go ahead. You know, and, and and so anything that I say, I mean, I can be really winsome and I can be really wistful and I can be really, you know, <laughs> seeker friendly. And I am like, I'm a nice guy. I mean, despite my Twitter, like I'm a really nice guy and I really like talking to people and I'm very open and I can talk to almost anybody, but it's always going to sort of come to the point where, you know, that's not enough. Like me being like a nice guy as a witness to, to the, 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 the faith, you know, is not enough because the niggas say, yeah, but you know, your church um, uh, uh, aided and abetted predat predation, <coughs> right? And, yeah. and and when they found out, uh, they they protected the predators. They didn't protect the innocent and the weak. And you know, what do you say to that? Because they're right. Yeah. You know, they're, they're right. right. They're absolutely now, right. No, no, I'm I'm I understand the limit. You know, sort of the human limitations of the human elements of the. The, the the organization but boy that is a lot of pretzel twisting for me to get there even and i'm a fairly mature guy you know i don't expect oh, boy. a 17 year old to get that i don't expect a 45 yeah. year old you know working parent to get that they're like you know tell me why i should care about this bull you know that, that's the vibe that is the vibe, which is my last article in CWR said, you know, Rome synodals while the world burns. And exactly. the, 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 the fact of the matter is, is that the signs of the times, the existential crisis of our age is the simmering, profound monism of meaninglessness, mm -hmm. the, the, the absolute crushing nihilism and atheism and unbelief and secularity of our times. This is this is the proprietary watermark of the modern world unbelief. OK, this is what the church should be confronting. And it doesn't. We're synodaling. But worse than that, the only arson, the only weapon in the church's arsenal that she really has to combat this unbelief. You've mentioned it already. Witness, holiness, yeah. witness. Right. OK, instead, we issue position papers on climate change all the while we're hiding, still hiding, still hiding sexual predators and covering up for them. I want to say to every bishop that I meet shut up. Yeah. That's what I want to say to him. Yeah, yeah, Do yeah. you understand? I'm a little bit hyperbolic here. I'm I on know, a roll. Yeah, yeah. But what I want to say to all of them, do you understand that you have precisely zero credibility to speak yeah. on anything right. until you clean this mess up? Yeah. Until you show us that you're serious about this mess. And well, that I, starts I, I, at the top. Yeah, I would say, how can you be serious about that if, if you know, folks at the top basically serve as a kind of backstop have served as a kind of backstop for the worst people yeah you know it, it's 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 yeah. not a sort of an unfortunate thing here or there it's like the worst people and yeah. and and you know what what can you do you know you're in your diocese in the middle of you know the united states of america i mean what can you do um if 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 anything you say or do will be totally undermined um, <clears throat> by by Rome. You know, it's like it's like so then you really are just a middle manager. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime, you know, it's like it's like I've talked to teachers at 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 other places, you know, at public schools and other Catholic schools. I work at a good school and I'm very fortunate for that, you know, so that, for instance, if I have something blow up in my classroom and I have to um uh, send, you know, Billy home or what have you, my administration is going to back me up. And I know that my headmaster believes in, in learning and order and all of those necessary things for real education to take place. And so I don't have to be um, cynical at all. You know, I know that when I, you know, my word is, is real and it's going to be backed up, you know, and, but I know plenty yeah. of people who operate in schools where, you know, you send your kid to the office or, you know, you, you kick them out of the office and then, and then it's like a revolving door right back in and nobody gets disciplined. Nobody gets sent home. Nobody gets suspended because nobody wants to be a racist or, or what have you, you know, fill in the blank, right? It doesn't matter, but, but nobody wants to be the bad guy. And so there you are. And so, so you recognize very early on as a teacher in that scenario that nothing you're doing matters, right? So not only is discipline not matter, but neither does Macbeth, you know, neither does 
quadratic equations. Neither does That's right. the periodic table. None of this matters because yeah. the word is not real. The authority is fake authority. You know, it's, it really does keep going back. What need what needs to happen so that there aren't these along those lines? There aren't these revolving doors of whatever. Uh, we say, you know, what could happen out of the synod that we would remember ten years from now? Mm -hmm. How about this? How about giving uh, individual bishops the authority to laicize a deacon or That's a right. priest? That's right. I mean, I'm a, a people know yeah. I'm a laicized deacon. I yeah. was a transitional deacon three months away from ordination to priesthood when I walked away right. by mutual agreement. With, I went to my bishop and I was Bishop Keating, Arlington, Virginia. Great guy. He's passed on to his reward. I said, Bishop Keating, I just can't do this. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm not going to uh, present myself for ordination to the priesthood. I would like to be laicized. Mm -hmm. And he understood perfectly a very pastoral and gentle man. Mm -hmm. And so he said, okay, we'll start the case now and we'll send it to Rome. And I remember walking out of that thinking, why can't he just lay aside? Yeah, yeah. I knew he couldn't, yeah, but I remember yeah, thinking, no, yeah. why does Rome have to be the final? Now, now that's just in a fairly benign case as with sure, me. Sure, I just sure. don't want yeah, yeah, yeah. But think about a bishop who's got a priest that's sexually predatory on minors who gets arrested and he's thrown in jail. And that bishop now should have the power to immediately lay aside that priest, completely take him out of the. But no, he's got to send that case to Rome. And now that priest has all these canonical rights and a right to a trial. Uh, uh, it takes sometimes years and years and years for Rome to finally decide, yeah, maybe we'll lay aside this guy after all. When in order for there to be immediate disciplinary impact, a bishop ought to be able to step in and say, you're out of here. Now, of course, that can be abused, right? Yeah, but a there's bishop, always, re but that's where you have recourse on, on, that, on the That's on the right. End, there would be canonical right? rules about a priest might have to, you know, you might have a, a court of appeal that you can go to. I was going to say, that's why we have appellate courts, right? This is this Yeah, is you know, that there might be a priest, a priest council that has to look into or something, right? Yeah. But it, in other words, it doesn't all automatically have. But this so then the, in the priest sex abuse thing, I know a lot of bishops have complained about the fact you know, they get blamed because Father so-and-so is still on the payroll, even though he raped a little kid. Yeah. And then the bishop has to come out and say, yeah, well, we sent it to Rome 10 years ago and yeah. they've done nothing with it. Right. right. OK, so you're right. I mean, when when and then it just becomes this revolving door and right. Rome well, that's says what I, well, that's what that's what I mean about the middle management problem. Right. You know, it's that the problem yeah. of being a middle manager with, with a with a um the boss you know the sort of the upper level boss king pope whatever fill in the blank um you know when you have an absentee boss who's sort of really not interested in doing his job but sort of really likes the authority of being in that position is you yeah. have this, this this kind of dysfunction and you realize that you're just a pass-through right and if you're just a pass-through then not my problem then you know and and by by reorienting that sense of of local power local authority i think it would have an interesting you know I, I would want to think through the sort of potential, you know, costs for making that kind of alteration or re-emphasis. But man, I got to tell you that, you know, I can imagine, I can see a ton of of reinvigoration of local church just by virtue of the fact that the yeah. people who are closest to it actually have skin in the game. And right now you really do get the sense that the real actions in Rome, right? Why am I even yeah. bothering with the chancery? Yeah. Because ultimately i want to go drink wine and have pasta in rome and it's nice in rome as you know rome is beautiful right so so i think that that would really change things it's, it reminds me of a kind of um you know i i you know, i'm one of those weirdos who thinks that the constitution was um somewhat castrated when they shifted uh the um appointment of senators from state jurisdiction to uh a popular vote you know, I think that that has had a downstream effect of nullifying local authority and local state government, and local state politics to such a way that now everything's national. And so it has. It has yeah, everything is national, state. whereas it is, before... it is weakened state um, because it used to be, you know, the way you became a senator was to be deeply involved and entrenched right in the, the happenings of the specific state. Anyway, that's a little bit of a well. Yeah, a weird if you wanted to if you wanted to influence who the senator from your state became, then you voted for the the state senator from your district right. Right. to go to your state's legislature. Right. Right. Okay, and therefore, to therefore vote. the governors matter, local representatives matter, local you know state senators matter. That's right. Yeah, like it kind of doesn't. Like they're these sort of weird 50, 50 people who can kind of do it. Yeah. No, it's it's such a yeah. weird thing. Yeah. But 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 it it has again, people would say, oh, but you know. 
popular election of the Senate. The people should have a say. But in a weird sort of way, they now have lost. Now their they have say. less less say right. less say yeah, yeah, because yeah. politics is no longer local. Yeah, and that's why I'm, in, so, I'm intrigued so, so, by this by by that that potential thing. You know, if that if yeah, that were to come yeah. out of the Senate, my goodness, that'd be amazing. Yeah, but you see me. This is my point. We're we can wrap this up yep. now because we're going. Yep. But to me. This is what a synod on synodalism should be talking about. Mm -hmm. The church's finances. How do we appoint bishops? Mm -hmm. Well, the power for laicization, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Those would have direct, really profound impacts on it. No, we're talking about how do we listen to the peripheries? Mm -hmm. What the hell does that even mean? Yeah, right. I mean, you get so much, you, you know, my sense of it is, you know, so much of the, the, the sort of the, the patois of the synod on synodality sort of boils down to this, of which I don't disagree with, by the way. Don't be an asshole. Just don't be an <laughs> asshole. Like, okay. <laughs> What's the but, Latin for that? Come yeah, up right. with a Latin cat. I know, I need to. But, like, for, but seriously. Don't be an asshole in Latin. Yeah. But like, that's it. Just don't be an ass. You know, be kind. You know, yeah. remember yeah. your authority, but also be kind. You know? That's yeah. like, if if that's great. If that's what a listening church means, it's like you know when you that's can right. look at, at look at the person in your office and say, "I see you. I recognize who you are." That's powerful. Don't be an ass. Everything else, I don't know what it is, honestly. You know, I think that might be a fitting way to end this conversation. I think so. I think so. <laughs> Kale Zeldin, don't be an ass. That's and right. by the way, I almost wore a baseball cap in your honor. Oh, here to the, oh you're going to for the viewers who that. don't understand, Kale and. Kale actually kind of went viral I on did, Twitter yeah. X, yeah. where he said that uh, men who wear yeah. baseball caps in public, yeah. uh, uh, long story short, that's not a good thing. Men should go back yeah. to wearing more proper hats, you know, right. caps well, yeah. and fedoras and so if you're interested in my what I really meant by this tweet that did go viral, I got like close to four million views. It's really insane. It was totally insane. Yeah, I did a Substack post on it, so if you want to check that out, you can go look at my Substack. But basically. I think men should, you know, not be. And your Substack is called the underneath. I don't it promote is, yeah. it. I yeah. don't promote it enough. And I apologize to you for yeah, that. So I'm trying I just... to, I'm trying to write there twice a week now. And um, yeah. So anyway, if you want a fuller explanation, but I think that men should dress like men, right? It, boys are great. Love boys, but you know, men should become men and they should aspire to being a man. And part of that is dressing like a man. I'm not a fashionista. I am not some sort of like precious, you know, that's not what I mean by this. I well, don't, this... I don't hold myself up as, as some sort of fashion plate is what I mean. In other words, but uh, I try, yeah. you know, when I'm in public, I want to dress like a man, not like a man child. So that was, that was the here point. on my farm. I wear in my farm. I wear a baseball cap and my, yeah. my great passion in life is fishing. And when I go yeah. out, I wear a baseball yeah. well, cap. That's but the joke, Larry. If I, like, it, when I cut the grass, when I do yard work, baseball I wear a baseball cap. cap. Yeah. Of course but I guess do. guess what? When I'm in Rome, walking the streets of Rome, yeah. I'm wearing a, one of those little nice Love Roman it. hats. And so, Love yeah, it. I'm wearing that. Or if I go someplace formal, I have a, a couple of nice formal hats. Yeah. I don't wear a baseball cap to a wedding re rehearsal, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, you wear something more formal. So I agree yeah. with you, Kale. Yeah. I'm on your side of this I debate. That. I appreciate but that. But I did almost wear my Nebraska Cornhuskers <laughs> uh, base football cap, I guess, a Love baseball it. cap. Yeah. Uh, but, but anyway, hey, Kale, thank you so much uh, for a being on today. You and I could talk it. for like hours and yeah, hours and yeah, hours, we and we've been well, at this I'll, for like over an hour and 15 Yeah, I'd like to now. invite you back when you get, I'm sure you're going to be busy right when you get back, but we should, I should have you on. I'd love to sort of do a debrief on what you saw and, you know, all the, all the, all the hoopla, but I think that'd be great. So uh, yeah, it would be. So let's yeah. do it. All, all right. right. Thanks for everybody for listening. Bye-bye. Be well.